going uh, through the Bible and uh, from the beginning to the end and uh, using 20 C's, uh, going from the Bible from beginning to end using the 20 C's. And uh, we are on our 11th C. We are over halfway there, folks. We only have how many more? Nine. You guys are good. And uh, you guys are paying attention. And uh, so I'm very thankful uh, for the study. Hope that it's been helpful to you. And uh, so if you need a handout and didn't get one, uh, Brad, you guys got one over there. All right. And uh, give them one. That's great. Appreciate that. And uh, this will help you follow along and get right in where we are. And uh, this is our Bible study, uh, going uh, through the Bible from the beginning uh, to the end using the 20 C's. And, uh, and so, uh, Wesley, if you could bring that up on the screen if it's not. There we go. And uh, this is tonight, and it's, uh, we're going to deal with what? What's on the screen? Construction. Amen. And uh, how many... Uh, how many of you love construction? Boy, I do. Something about new construction. That new wood smell. Uh, when that concrete gets poured, even that smells good. And uh, those, that wood and even how they uh, burn the two by four sometimes when the blades are dull. And, and uh, sometimes it gets a little burn on that uh, two by four. Or, or you hear uh, uh, that that saw kind of binding up on the plywood as it's going through there. And, and uh, man, there's just something about the smell and it, something about new construction that's wonderful. And, uh, but uh, I have to be honest with you, I like new construction when someone else is doing it, though. When you're remodeling, it ain't all that pleasant. You start off with the bang, uh, but end with a fizzle sometimes. How many of you know what I'm talking about with a little remodeling going on? And uh, I tell you, man, those projects seem... I, God should have never let DIY come on TV. <laughs> do it yourself. And uh, I, I tell you, do it yourself network, man. It has just, it's been terrible. And uh, man, I'll give you some home projects. And, uh, but I'm thankful for tonight because this, we're going to deal with construction. And uh, if you would, bring up the next slide. kind of gives us all. Here's all the C's we've studied so far. And, and uh, we've gone through these and recapped. I'll do it next time and uh, for the sake of time. But we've covered a lot of C's. And if you've missed any of those, uh, the beautiful thing about this, you can kind of just jump in wherever. But we have uploaded all of our video services are now uh, up to date on our website and all our audio is on there, so you can get caught up. You can go back to the table back there to my right, your left, and catch all the uh, uh, blanks or all the handouts that you may have missed, so you can follow along on that. But I'd also encourage you uh, to follow us on uh, Facebook or Twitter, and uh, those things will help you. And uh, if you don't know what, I, what I'm talking about, you can just uh, kind of tune me out for that. Uh, but uh, for some of you that are uh, technology savvy and you like that stuff, I'd encourage you to follow us on that stuff because every time we update something, it goes automatically to those accounts and, uh, and to those uh, 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 media things that we have. And uh, we're always, I'm trying to always post something on there and uh, just to keep our people in, informed. And uh, it'll be a great thing for you to do. And uh, it's a way for you to get automatically informed, uh, especially if you follow us. And uh, you don't have to always go to our website and find stuff out or do that. And uh, if you haven't been to our website lately, uh, I encourage you to go to it. Uh, we, we've just updated some other things. We've added new staff members. And, uh, and that's on there as far as King's Academy and uh, redone that. And uh, we're also, uh, our student ministries logo is now on there. And it's also under our ministry page. I would just encourage you to get familiar with your church's web page. All right? Uh, so enough about that. If you look at your handout, uh, let me kind of give you the synopsis as you have on every handout on Wednesday night of kind of what we're going to talk about uh, tonight. And if you got your Bible while I'm talking, you can, do, you can listen and go to Ezra, okay? So go to the book of Ezra. Now, if you don't know where Ezra is, look it up, all right? You got a table of contents there, and uh, it's fine. Don't, don't be ashamed. Uh, just go right to the table of contents, okay? It's in the very front of your Bible, and uh, you might have to go through a few pages, uh, whatever. And uh, I would encourage you to go to the book of Ezra, all right? 
and uh, all your books in the Bible. And my, uh, by the way, I think our Awana kids, I know that uh, my two smallest ones are, uh, they're learning the books of the Bible. They're supposed to repeat the books of the Bible tonight. And uh, right now they're finishing up the Old Testament. So it's good for us, even as adults, to get familiar with the books of the Bible. Would you agree with that? And, uh, and so I want to encourage you to go to uh, the book of Ezra. But while you're turning there, and if you've already done that, great. But look at the kind of uh, synopsis of the handout. Uh, the scriptures tonight will come out of Ezra, Nehemiah, and uh, 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 Esther. And uh, Peyton calls that Easter. He's been learning the books of the Bible. And every time he gets there and he goes, Easter? We have told him ten times it's not Easter, son. Uh, it's Esther. But uh, even if he says Easter, I'm giving him credit. Amen. And, uh, I mean, he's doing really good. And uh, Haggai, and uh, some pronounce it Haggai, but it's really Haggai. And uh, Zechariah, then Malachi. And then the focal point is the rebuilding of Jerusalem. So therefore, we're talking about, and pull it up, Wesley, on the screen, construction, rebuilding of Jerusalem. Why? What happened? Why are we rebuilding it? What happened? We just studied it last week. It got destroyed, man. They went into captivity, remember? And uh, they went into bondage again. They went into captivity. And uh, the Syrian army and the Babylonian army, man, they came in and took, I mean, they took care of business. And uh, they wiped them out. And uh, because they rejected God, remember, uh, remember Jeroboam, remember the uh, camel thing we have here, Humphrey? We just took him down getting ready uh, for the wedding this weekend. And uh, uh, Jeroboam, he didn't want to go down to Jerusalem and worship the Lord like he was told to do, did he? And he says, i tell you what, I'll just build some golden idols right here in, in Dan. And, and uh, I'll build some in Bethel. He says, I'll just put them idols up here. And so he built these two uh, golden idols and said, forget this. Uh, let's make it easy on our feet and travel expenses. Uh, let's just worship these. And man, God let them. But they started serving false idols, uh, graven images, and boy, it led to their destruction. They turned their back on God. So we're going to talk about tonight the rebuilding of Jerusalem. Principal characters, here's the, here they are. Zerubbabel. You're not even going to have to write that down. Amen? Zerubbabel. Let's say it together. Ready, go. Zerubbabel. Isn't that fun? That is fun. There's some great names in the Bible, by the way. Uh, not one you want to name your kid, but uh, those are good names. They're fun. Ezra, Nehemiah, king of Persia. We'll talk a little bit about that. And uh, does anybody know who the king of Persia is before we get to it? Good. We're going to teach it to you. All right. Babylon. Here's the primary events. Uh, Babylon overthrown by Persia. So uh, Babylon overthrew uh, uh, Judah. But now they get overthrown. And we're going to talk about that. Uh, Zerubbabel rebuilds the temple. Ezra reestablishes the temple worship and the law. Incredible story there. And then Nehemiah rebuilds the wall of Jerusalem. I love Nehemiah. And it, Nehemiah is incredible, Miss Boots. It, if you want to know what a godly leader should look like and be like, go to Nehemiah and study Nehemiah. Nehemiah will get you all fired up. And you know what they say, if you can't get fired up about the Bible, then what? Your wood's wet. I was hoping somebody would remember that. Yeah, your wood's wet. Well, I don't know if your wood's wet or not, but let me tell you this. God's Word will light a fire under you, and it'll help you, and it'll encourage you. It'll challenge you. But Nehemiah is a great book to go to. And I don't know where you are in your Bible study during the week, but uh, Nehemiah would be a great place for you uh, to go to. All right, so are you in the book of Ezra? Okay, I'm not, so let me get there. And, uh, whoops, it's somewhere around here. Hold on, I'm going to get there. Okay. Now, something significant happens. Whoops. Something significant happens. It's pretty amazing. Uh, something significant happens here now. So you have, you have, the, you have the two kingdoms. That, that the, the kingdom was one. Then they were split, obviously, by poor leadership. Everybody did not want to obey God and listen to God. So the kingdom got split. Uh, ten tribes and two tribes. Uh, uh, northern kingdom, southern kingdom. We've talked all about that. Then they both go into captivity. That, that was the last thing we talked about. And something significant here happens now. God's people, after being in captivity for 70 years... 
The Persians uh, had totally conquered everyone during that 70 years. The, 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 the kingdom uh, or the mighty army of Persia, I mean, they swept the world, man. They were a powerhouse. Uh, nobody stood in their way. And uh, you, you, you talk about, and, and sometimes you watch movies and they talk about King, uh, King of Persia, or they'll mention stuff like that. What they're talking about is how powerful they were. I mean, these guys were geniuses in, in fighting. And, and so they totally conquered everyone. And uh, King Cyrus was the king of Persia. King Cyrus. Everybody say King Cyrus. King Cyrus. There you go. And in your handout, write this in. This will be the first thing. King Cyrus issued a proclamation allowing Jews to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the house of God. Did you get that? He allowed them to return. Uh, it's kind of incredible, to be quite honest with you. And so go to Ezra chapter 1. It took me forever to get to Ezra. Ezra chapter 1. Now look at verse 1. Ezra chapter 1, verse 1. And uh, let's see. In my Bible, it's 514. That doesn't help you a lick, does it? Well, it is. It's in my Bible, 514. All right? And, uh, of course, my Bible's really small, and uh, that's why it's uh, a low number. All right? So King Cyrus issued a proclamation allowing Jews to uh, return uh, to Jerusalem, rebuild the house of God. Hey, say, whoopee do. It is a whoopee do. Let me tell you why. All right? I'm going to explain it to you. And uh, look at verse 1. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, uh, that the word of the Lord by mouth of Jeremiah, there's Jeremiah again, that prophet, man, he's everywhere, might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he, might, uh, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, here it is, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord uh, God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. I mean, it's incredible. Look at verse 3. Who is there among you of all his people? His people be with him. His God should, I should say, be with him. And let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God which is in Jerusalem. Now, when Babylon came and took Jerusalem in captivity, they destroyed the temple. You remember that. Now, 70 years later, uh, King Cyrus says, Hey, anybody want to go back uh, to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple? It's incredible. Here's a guy who conquered everything, who, 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 who took over really the world, and, and then God stirred his heart up, and he lets his own people that really, their own, his own captivity or his own slaves or, or, or the people that he conquered, he let them go back. I mean, this is incredible. And by the way, this was prophesied in Isaiah 44, 28, if you're taking notes, uh, more notes over a century before Cyrus was born. I love that about God's Word. God's Word informs you about His Word. God's Word is a great commentary on His own Word. And so in Isaiah uh, uh, 44, he, he tells about this a century before Cyrus was even born. He even provided, now listen to this, this is what's amazing. King Cyrus provided the money for the temple to be built. Isn't that incredible? Hey, anybody want to go home? Yep. I'll tell you what. Here, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send you back, and uh, I'm going to give you the money and the materials for rebuilding the temple, which was their national sanctuary. I mean, isn't this unbelievable? I mean, here's a guy that just says, hey, by the way, I, I'm going to foot the bill. I mean, now, if any of you want to write a check tonight and complete out the budget uh, for the remainder of the year, I'll supply the pen. Amen? I mean, can you imagine? He goes, hey, any of you guys want to go back to your own land? Like, can you imagine how their heart felt? Like, yeah. Man, we forsook that. We, we just obeyed God, and here you are wanting us to go back. Yeah, we'd like to go. Uh, do you want to rebuild your, your, your temple? Uh, God says you should rebuild that temple. Uh, yeah, we'd love to do that. I, I'll take care of it if you want to go. 
Hope, I'll, I'll be packed in 24 hours. I mean, I mean, can you imagine this? He says, I'll foot the bill. Now, in your handout, the decree of Cyrus brought an official end to the captivity. So when Cyrus makes this decree, captivity's over. It's a done deal. Over. God had foretold that it would last for 70 years, by the way, in Jeremiah uh, 29, 10 through 14. And uh, for the sake of time, we're not going to look that up. But in Jeremiah 29, 10 through 14, he foretells this. That's going to even last for 70 years. And by the way, it did. He warns them about the fact before it begins. They are in captivity and Jeremiah comes and he prophesies to them that it would happen. But they didn't obey him. They didn't obey These 70 years, by the way, represent all the Sabbath years, which was one every seventh year, where Israel refused to allow the land to rest as they were commanded to by God. In Leviticus 25, and you can read about it there, and you can read about it in 2 Chronicles. I don't know if that's in your handout, but you might want to write that down. And uh, you you can write that down if you'd like. We're not going to look that up for tonight. But here's what happened. They were to let the land rest every seven years. And by the way, that's a good principle. Even for farmers today, they still abide by that. Some do it six years. Some do it every five years. But it's still a good principle. Uh, There's a purpose in in that. Not just because God commanded it, but but also for the nutrients because you deplete it out of the soil. Anyway, uh, here in Leviticus 25 and in 2 Chronicles 36, uh, it it is told uh, that, that that's what represents. That's why it was seven years. Because he did it, God, God uh, rebuked them for every seventh year that they disobeyed. The captivity, by the way, uh, did something. Uh, uh, when they were in captivity, I, I tell you what, uh, let's go to, hold your bookmarker in Ezra just for a moment. I, I think we might come back to there. Uh, but go to Second Chronicles. Now, it's only to your left. It's not far. Okay, just a, just a couple books there. Actually, a one book to your left, sorry. 2 Chronicles 36. You shouldn't have to go far. 2 Chronicles 36. And let's look at verse 20 and 21. 2 Chronicles 36, 20 and 21. Uh, we got time. 20 and 21. Okay, 20, 21. You there? Amen? Amen. Verse 20 says, And them that had escaped from the sword carried he away to Babylon, where they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of who? Just told you. Jeremiah came and said, It's coming, it's coming, it's coming. No, it ain't. We're going to do what we want to. Came. Should have listened. Jeremiah was right. And to the land had enjoyed her what? God said, let it rest. Hey, is God always right, yes or no? Come on, obey him, right? I mean, seriously, Jeremiah says, get with the program. They're like, no, we're doing our own thing. Uh, Let it rest, God said. We're not letting it rest. Pedal to the metal, man. Plow it up, let's do it. No, you better do it. Okay, captivity. You're going to get it. Verse 21, for as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and ten years. Amazing. Amazing here that they disobeyed it. And by the way, the captivity cured the Jews of idolatry and caused them to desire to know and obey God's word. All this was for a purpose. Want to know what the purpose was? To cure them of their rebelliousness. Want to know why it's good to discipline your children? Because it'll cure them of their disobedience. It'll cure them. Have you ever noticed how, how that hard times in your life can cause you to rethink your, li- rethink your life and really get your heart right with God? You ever been there? Where there were trials that came in your life, consequences, and you're like, all right, all right, wake up call. I get it. You want to know why God does that and allows that to happen in your life? Uh, So you could get cured from it. That's why. God does that in your life and in my life. 
It did it for Israel, and they got right with God. You know what? Hard times can be a great cure sometimes. You know, as Christians, we sometimes get the mentality, hey, I'm a Christian, nothing bad should happen. Hey, I'm a Christian, I go to church, I mean, I got a Bible, I mean, I even sing and raise my hand halfway, you know, and I'll even pray when they say to pray, and I won't look and peek and stuff like that. I mean, why am I going through this stuff? It may be because God's trying to cure you from yourself. And oftentimes, man, we kick against the pricks, don't we? We just buck that thing and we fight it. And God's just saying, hey, I'm trying to get a message to you. Israel got it. And once again, we see Israel or God responding in mercy to his people that were prone to wander. You ever sing that song, you know, uh, Lord, I'm prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. What's that song called, Donnie? You know it? Prone to wander. Some of you, come on, some of you folks know that. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. What's the name of that song? You people are not helping me at all. <laughs> Wicked people, man. I'm just kidding. I, some of you are going to think about that. You know, prone to leave the God I love. Um, now I'm going to be thinking about that song now. Some of you are singing it. Anyway, don't worry about it. Just forget it. Get it out of there. I put that in there. Now you won't forget it. So here, here, here's what happens. And we can look at Israel. How, let me, through these 20 seas, we're on the 11th sea. What has Israel done through this whole process? Even, I mean, we're, we're going to be done with the Old Testament tonight. Old, the Old Testament is going to be done. I know it's been a brief overview and it's been fast. But, but what have they done through the Old Testament, Israel? What have they done? They rebelled and then what? Repented. Rebel, repent, rebel. I mean, they've done the R and R, and I'm not talking about rest and relaxation, man. They they rebelled, repent, rebelled, repent, rebelled, repent. Who's just like that? Yeah, we, me, you. We are just like that. Man, we are hard-headed, we are knuckleheads, and we are, are really, uh, we're not Israel, but we're really no different in our actions sometimes. We are just like this. Look at Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah 29. you got to go way to the right now. Several books. Jeremiah 29. 29. Jeremiah 29. Look at Jeremiah 29. You know what I love about this is, you're very familiar with this verse, Jeremiah 29, 11. Jeremiah 29, 11. Uh, the Bible says, for I know, he says, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of what, church? Peace. He goes, and not of what? To give you an expected end. God says, man, my thoughts are for you. My thoughts are for you, Israel. My thoughts are for you, people. And it's not to hurt you. It's not to harm you. It's to help you. It's to love you. And it's to give you a life of what? Peace. Do you know that even a life of turmoil, and you may have circumstances that are crazy and and, and full of turmoil, that you can still have the peace of God in your life? God says, man, that's what I'm trying to give you. That's what he was wanting to give Israel. I want to be your peace. Let me do it. Quit fighting me and let me be your peace. It's incredible here. God is so for you. But man, do we fight him sometimes, right? I mean, sometimes we don't even want to get in his book. It's not some, uh, you know, it's not maybe some blatant sin or some uh, wicked thing that we do. Uh, We're just not faithful reading his own word. We're not faithful praying. And all God says is, you know what? I I, I just want to bring you peace. You know that passes all understanding? You remember that? Uh, That's the peace I want to give you. 
that passes what? You can't explain it. Right? That's some good peace right there, my friend. Oh, man, you just look like you're full of peace. I know I can't explain it. You're weird. No, it's just right with what God's Word says. See, if you give me something, I can explain that. can't explain what God does because it's miraculous. It's beyond your finite thinking. God says, that's me. I love that about God. Man, God, I need that in my life. I need you to do some stuff that just blows me away. I need you to do some stuff that's just incredible. I just need some peace, man. I need some peace. You know, you can't buy that at the dime store, right? You can't get that stuff. This Sunday, this Sunday morning's message, I'm going to kind of continue with the theme, but this Sunday's morning's message is uh, continued, what's your problem? What's your problem? Are you being a worry wart? Now, y'all need to show up for that, right? Bring your friends, because you know you got some people worry all the time. Their life is full of that stuff. I just want to share with you from God's Word how you can overcome that. I'm not saying that you won't be concerned about things, but it won't consume you. I mean, it, it, God wants to your life not to be consumed with worry. He wants your life to be consumed with what? Jeremiah 29, 11. Peace! Man, if it's not, it may be because you aren't listening, aren't obeying, and you're doing it your way. Here the Jews begin to re-enter the land and rebuild the holy city of Jerusalem. And so in your handout, write this in. The first company that returned under Zerubbabel, uh, a prince of Judah. He was a prince of Judah. So, so here comes the first company, okay? Uh, King Cyrus says, okay, go. And there's a, a group that returns, all right? And, and, and they return under Zerubbabel. Everybody say that, Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel. There you go, Zerubbabel. Yeah, just roll it off, man. Just do it. It's fun. And in your handout, I believe it says this group consists of less than 50,000 people. Really, it was around 42. If you really look it up, it's not even 50,000. It's around 42,000, all right? But in your handout, I want you to write this in. But because of opposition and spiritual indifference, the work was ceased or caused was to cease for about 16 years. Write that in. 16, yes. 16. Now, go to Haggai, if you would. Go to Haggai. It's after Zephaniah and before Zechariah. <laughs> Some of you are like, so what? That didn't help me. You gotta, you gotta get there, but man, here I'm telling you to go there, and I can't get there. Okay, here we go. It's after Zephaniah. This is a great book, but I'm, a, I'm gonna teach you this book. I'm gonna do a series. I'm trying to put something together now for this, and uh, just going through this and looking. Haggai, okay. Haggai chapter one. 16 years. All right, get there. They're done. Man, they're like, hey, go in the land, rebuild. And then all of a sudden, the, the work stops for 16 years. 16 years. Why? Well, look at Haggai chapter 1. Look at verse 2. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts. Hope you're there. If you're not, just act like you are. Fake it. Saying, this people say the time has not come. The time that the Lord's house should be built. Hey, I know we're supposed to be building this thing. And I know this is what God wants, and I know this is what we should be doing, but, you know, it's not really time yet. Really? 16 years is not time yet? It's like, what are, you, what are you doing? I mean, the temple is a mess and a waste. They have been building their own uh, things. Look at this, verse 14, Haggai uh, chapter 1. Look at verse 14, jump there. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of uh, Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. Here's what's happened. Zerubbabel is checking this thing out, and it's just not had anything happening for 16 years. And what was happening is the temple's a mess, it's a waste. They had been building their own buildings, their own homes, and letting the house of the, lie, uh, of the Lord lie dormant. 
They hadn't been doing what they were told to do. Procrastination has now set in big time. Big problem. The people made time for everything else but rebuilding the temple. During this time, God raised up prophets like uh, Haggai and Zechariah to go and speak to the people, encourage them to begin the work. Now, I hope you didn't leave Ezra. Okay, you probably did. Keep your bookmarker in Haggai. Finger, put something there. Go back to the book of Ezra and go to chapter 5. Sorry about that. Actually, you can leave uh, Haggai. How about that? Make it easy for you. But go to the book of Ezra. Go back there and look at chapter 5, verse 1. Then the prophets of Haggai, the prophet, and Zechariah, the son of Iddo, prophesied unto the Jews that were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel, even unto them. So here they come. Here comes the guys. Here comes the messengers. And they're coming to tell them, get the work done. Do what you're supposed to do. Now look at chapter 6, verse 14. And the elders, chapter 6, verse 14, and the elders of the Jews builded, and they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai, the prophet Zechariah, the son of Idu. And they builded and finished it according to the commandment of the God of Israel, of God of Israel, and according to the commandment of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. Artaxerxes. Some great names in the Bible, man. Art. We'll just call him Art for tonight. Brother Art. There we go. Oh, good old Artie. Say, what happens? In your handout, write this in. The people got busy building again. And about five years later, the temple was completed and dedicated with great joy. Okay, so picture. Go, King, King Cyrus says, go, man. You, whoever wants to go, go. About 42,000. Just go. He says, I'll fund it. They go, and uh, they don't build it for 16 years. Man lies dormant for 16 years. They don't do anything. Nothing's being done. They build their own houses, build their own kingdoms. They're doing, building chicken pens, whatever they got going. They're doing their own thing. They're not, even, they're not even doing it. God sends prophets. They go and say, hey, get it done. God said, do it, and we're come to tell you, listen to God. And so they go. Now, you're still in Ezra 6, hopefully. Look at Verse 15. And this house was finished on the third day of the month, Adar, which was in the sixth year of the reign of Darius the king. Say, what in the world does that mean? Well, uh, here, here's what happens. And, and they finish it. It's done. And it's about five years later. I'm going to explain that in just a moment. But that verse tells you a little bit about it. And uh, don't want to bore you with the details. But I do need to point out something to you in just a moment. But first, before we do that, write this in. The second expedition had one already come. Now there's a second expedition, but was led by Ezra, who we've talked quite a bit about, who's a scribe about 78 years after Zerubbabel's return. I love saying these names, man. They're fun. And uh, if you've been wondering what I do in my office, I say names all day long. <laughs> Just kidding. I don't, I don't do that. Donnie probably thinks I do sometimes. I'm in there saying stuff. Who's Ezra? He was a scribe whose heart was to teach the commandments and statutes of God in Israel. He wanted to restore the, uh, 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 the vow of separation that Israel was supposed to be separate. He wanted to inspire of reverence for God and his holy word. That was Ezra's heart, man. Ezra's like, man, I'm putting the law back, the Mosaic law back in place. I want the people to be reverent to a holy God and his holy word. I want them to be separate and called out just like God wanted them to be. Man, you got to love Ezra for that, man. He, he wanted them to be completely focused on God and nothing else. Look at Ezra chapter 9. we got to hurry. Hurry up and get there. Ezra 9. Look at verse 5. And at the evening sacrifice, I rose up from the heaviness, or my heaviness, and having rent my garment, look at that, and my mantle, I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands unto the Lord my God. 
and said, Oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee, my God, for our iniquities are increased over our head and our trespasses grown up unto the heavens. Look at that. Man, he's just pleading before God. He's broken before God. And he just is so honest and transparent uh, on his face before God and says, we are so wicked, I am so embarrassed and ashamed of how we are treating you. Incredible, man. Look at verse 7. Since the days of our fathers have we been in a great trespass unto this day. And for our iniquities have we, our kings and our priests, been delivered into the land of the king of the lands, to the sword, to captivity. Look, he's recapping everything. It's incredible. And to a spoil and to confusion of face as it is this day. And now for a little space, grace has been showed from the Lord our God. To leave us our remnant to escape. Isn't that precious? And to give us a nail in his holy place that our God might be or may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. Lord, we just need a little grace from you. Just a little grace to set us free from our bondage. Verse 9. For we were bondmen, yet our God hath not forsaken us in our bondage. Man, isn't that good? God, you haven't forsaken me. Yeah, it's terrible. It's us who have turned our back, not you, God. He says, you haven't forsaken us in our bondage, but hath extended, what? Mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia to give us reviving, uh, uh, to set up the house uh, of our God and to repair the desolations thereof and to give us a wall in Judah and in Jerusalem. And now, O oh our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken thy commandments. He was a man of God who was charging the remnant with the Mosaic law. I mean, he was like, people, we have forsaken God. Let's get right and let's get back there. Man, isn't that every preacher's heart? Isn't that what every preacher should be doing? Getting the people right with God, getting them to stay on with God, stay focused on God. And that was Ezra. And under Ezra, the temple worship was reinstated and great revival came to the people. Uh, look at Ezra chapter 10, verse 1. He says, now when Ezra, Ezra had prayed, Ezra was a praying man. Uh, by the way, I believe that's first and foremost uh, what brings revival and gets people right with God. It's prayer. Never forget that, folks. Now when Ezra had prayed and we had confessed, weeping and casting himself down before the house of God, there assembled unto him out of Israel a very great congregation of men and women and children, for the people wept very sore. Want to know why where there's not revival in America? Want to know why? One, it's because people don't pray for it. Number two, they won't weep over it. Until you pray over it, start weeping over it, your own brokenness and your own sin, it'll never come. Revival never comes to the church until it comes to the people first. Ezra just proved it. Man, men and women and children broke out in weeping. Over their idolatry and their rebellion against God. In your handout, the final expedition was led by Nehemiah. This is my favorite part, and I gave it the least amount of time. I wish I'd have did better. Whose burden was to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and restore the people's dignity in the land. That's in Nehemiah chapter 1. Um, Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. I wish I had time. Uh, to look that up, but I don't. It's just so good. Here's what happened. The walls, the temple's being rebuilt. And it's finished, but the walls were still broken down. The gates were burned with fire and never replaced, leaving the city unprotected and a reproach in the land. And uh, I do want you to go to Nehemiah because we do need to look at a, a verse. So if you would, go to Nehemiah. To the right of Ezra, please. Just to the right. Look, look at um, Nehemiah. Uh, look at Nehemiah chapter 1. Just look at uh, verse 3, then look at verse 11. Chapter 1, verse 3, then 11, okay? Ch chapter 1, verse 3, then verse 11. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the prominence are in great affliction... And reproach. 
Look at this. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Verse 11. O Lord, I beseech thee, let thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name and prosper. I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. For I was the king's cupbearer. He just reminds him, hey, I, man, I, I, I serve, and, and uh, I, I'm a servant here. And here Nehemiah returns to Jerusalem 94 years after the return of Zerubbabel. And now look at chapter 2. I want you to look at verse 11 and 12. Nehemiah 2, verse 11 and 12. He says, So I came to Jerusalem, and it was there three days. I rose in the night, and some few men with me. Neither told I any man what God hath put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. Neither was there any base with me, save the beast that I rode upon. And there was no one there with him. He didn't tell anybody what God had laid on his heart. But then verse 17. Then I said unto them, You see the distress that we are in? He tells them, Look over this. Look at everything around you. How Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come, let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more reproached. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, and also the king's word that he had spoken unto me. And they said, here's how they responded, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. Man, don't you love people? Just come together. Get it done. No need to talk. No need to jabber. No need to get the pep rally going. No need to strike up the band. If that's what you say to Jeremiah, let's get it done. Man, you got to love that. And that was Jeremiah's heart. And in your handout, Nehemiah declared, let us rise up, arise, uh, arise and build with enthusiasm, prayer, and hard work. They finished this colossal tax. They, they finished it. They did it. And everyone did their part. And uh, some say this happened in 52 days, but uh, uh, and you may hear, about, hear that from different people. Uh, uh, I, I don't believe it was in 52 days. You can look at Jeremiah or, or Nehemiah uh, 4, 5, and 6, chapters 4, 5, and 6. And here's the deal. I, I believe 52 days after uh, this happened, they got it done. Uh, but the truth is, I believe it took 12 years. Um, because in Nehemiah chapter uh, 5, uh, in verses 14 through 16, Nehemiah mentions... He goes, and I'm still doing the work after 12 years. And, uh, and so I don't believe it happened in 52 days. doesn't really matter. Uh, you know, some may agree, some may uh, disagree. But either way, you got to take chapters 4, 5, and 6 in context and study it out. Uh, but the point is this. Whether they did it in 52 days uh, or 12 years, which I believe it's 12 years from God's Word, that uh, they got it done. Now, in your handout, I want to give you this statement. Imagine what we could comp accomplish if every believer found his or her place and had a mind and a will to work with united devotion for the cause of Christ. Get that. Get that and look up on the screen. Imagine what could be accomplished if every believer in his or her place had the mind, had the will with united devotion for the cause of Christ. What could we do? What could we do? I, I have a better, what couldn't we do? If we had united devotion, I mean, every person says, I won't be a sitter. I won't be a, I won't be a, a spectator. I'll be a participator. Man, I'll be one who participates. I'll be one who's involved. I won't let anything go uh, 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 undone or anything uh, uh, that's needed uh, not finished. Uh, I want to be a part of it, and I, I want to exercise my gifts however needed. And uh, imagine what we could do if we all got on board. I love Nehemiah. I love Nehemiah. Nehemiah was a guy who was just so passionate to make sure that a reproach was not brought upon God's people and God's name. You know what he did? He got people to get involved. And uh, church, you know what? That's why it's so important that we stay united. Uh, that's why the theme this year has been striving together.
for the faith of the gospel. Now, in your handout, there's a big black box or a small one should be. This kind of finishes out the Old Testament. Here's what happens. After the preaching of the prophet Malachi, uh, by the way, who preaches to the remnant of Israel as well, uh, it's the last book of the Old Testament. Uh, there's not another revelation of God. Uh, there, there, there's not another person who comes on the scene until John the Baptist um, proclaiming the coming of the Messiah and His kingdom. Nothing is said. Nothing is told. Nothing is written. And in your handout, there's a 400-year silent period in between Malachi and and John the Baptist. 400. Shh. Nothing said. Can you imagine? All of this has happened. And it's fast. And, and of course we couldn't care, cover every little detail. But the, all that you have gotten. All the overview that you have gotten. And, and, and have seen God working in miraculous ways. And everything that's happened. And all of a sudden. It's amazing, though, what begins to transpire because God did a new thing. And through the Gospels is what we'll tackle next. And you don't want to miss that next week. You do not want to miss that and the purpose of the Gospels. The four Gospels, what are they really about? And why did God have them written? Uh, I'm going to discuss that with you next week. Folks, I hope you're getting something out of this, all right? hope that you're studying. hope that you're getting something out of this. And I hope that this will just remind you that, you know what? God is always right. Remember, I, you are always in my thoughts, God says. And my, my, my thoughts are never to harm you, but to bring you peace. My, his peace. His peace. And I, Now, people take that verse out of context. But, but the truth is, I know God is for me. How many of you would agree with that? God's for you. He is. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for today.